Every person that ever lived has to make the same choice. You may not have power to change your whole life that you know needs to be changed, but if you surrender to Christ, he'll give you the power. That means to be willing to change your way of living. Come to Christ. He will give you a new strength and a new power. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Whoa, snow's like energy drinks for you guys. Hey, good morning, Westside. My name's Aaron Stroman. I'm one of the youth pastors here. And it is fantastic to see you this morning. Um, thanks for letting us join you. It's been fun having this student service, having the student worship team worship, uh, lead us in worship this morning has been great. I'm going to be giving the message this morning. And we're in a student ministry. We're in the middle of this series called Change. And so I'm going to give the same message that I'd be given if I was across the hall in the student center. And so I think, I think it's something that God has for, for all of us. We can all learn from this. And so I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Let's get into it. If you have your notes, go ahead and pull them out and wave them at me. Let me see them. We are purpose-driven note takers here at Westside Family Church. Now, normally I don't do notes in the student center because notes end up changing into paper airplanes and it just becomes a mess. See, this is why we don't, <laughs> that's why we don't do notes in the, in the student center. But we're doing notes this morning, so you got them. Hey, you, you need to take notes too, children, so pull your pens out. Here we go. The series is titled Change, and the, the big idea is that God is in the change business. God wants to change us from the inside out. Last week, I talked to the students about how Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave to change things. He didn't do that work on the cross and in the grave to keep things the same. It changes everything. And how does God do that? Well, this week we're going to be talking about um, how God uses people to help us change. And students next week in the, in the student center, we're going to be talking about the Bible. God uses the Bible to change. In fact, we read the Bible not to finish, but to change. It's not just a little task that we check off. We read it to change. But change is hard. Change is difficult. I think we'd all agree with that. Nobody really likes the idea of change. Like, hey, sign me up for change. I want to change everything in my life because that's hard. We're just by nature, we're, we're creatures of habit. We like routine. Change is hard. And let's, um, let's unpack this for just real quick because I think if we can understand why change is hard, we might be able to be a little more receptive and open to some change God, God has in store for us. I think the first and biggest reason change is hard is because it takes a shot at our pride. Change takes a shot at our pride. Because really, if we were to boil it down, change implies that we're not as, as good as we could be. Right On a scale of 1 to 10, we haven't arrived yet. We don't know it all. We don't have it all together. If we were self-sufficient, completely independent of anyone else, we could achieve perfection holiness, fill in the blank, we could achieve that on our own, but we can't. We need someone or God to come alongside of us, change us, and help us out a little bit. And that's, that takes a shot at our pride. It's hard to admit that we need help. It's hard to admit we don't have it all together. It's hard to admit we don't know the way. It takes a shot at our pride. The other reason change is hard is because it requires something different. Change requires something different. And you may be thinking, Aaron, that's over-obvious. That's a little bit silly. Of course, change is it's going to require something different. But how many times do we get to the point where we can acknowledge we need change? We could admit, you know, the failures in our life, our shortcomings, but we're not willing to do anything different. Maybe it's, it's losing some weight. I, I realize I need to lose weight, but I don't want to make my eating habits or exercise patterns any different. Maybe we, we realize, oh, I, need, I need to change my finances, but I'm not willing to make different my spending habits. Okay, change requires something different. And that's, that's hard. That's difficult. And the more personal change becomes, the more difficult it is to apply to our life. And so 
Just acknowledging that change is difficult, change is hard, it's going to push us out of our comfort zone, it's going to require something different. Let's make, let's make an agreement with each other and with God. Would you be open to the idea of some change this morning? Would you be willing to confess, all right, God, there might be some areas in my life I need change. And then will we give ourselves and each other some grace and mercy as we consider this change? Okay, let's not look at everyone else and point out everyone else's need for change. Let's just look at ourselves this morning. And if we can make that deal with one another, let's make that deal with God and just ask, ask him to soften our hearts for the idea of some change. Would you pray with me this morning? God, change is, uh, it's hard. It's difficult. Lord, we know that you're in the change business, and really, if we're going to follow you, you're going to get all up in our business. And so, God, may we lay down our pride. May we forget about knowing it all or um, having it all figured out for the sake of, of some change in our life. May we be open to that. You might have a better plan for us than we have for ourselves. Give us a grace and mercy, the, the gentleness to walk through this together this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. God uses people to help us change. God uses people to help us change. Before I jump into this, let me give a quick disclaimer. God doesn't use everyone to help us change. I'm going to be talking about being open to other people, speaking truth in your life, to giving you some, some feedback and, and reflection. But there are some people out there who, who the most you're going to get from them is just taking some notes of what they're doing, and that's your, you know, don't ever do this list. You know, they're teaching you things not to do, okay? So we need to practice some wisdom and discretion as we consider who God uses to help us change. But God uses people to help us change. I've grouped Three groups together of different types of people God uses to help us change. And the first group is people who are with us. People who are with us. And when I say people who are with us, people in our same life stage, we, people we have common ground with. Teenagers, for you, this may be a fellow student, maybe a friend, same age, same grade, same gender, someone's just doing life with you. They're a Christ follower. Okay, so you have that in common ground too, and I think that's important. But, but they're able to, to know your context, know who you are, and, and to give you some feedback in life. Ladies, maybe this is another lady in, in a, a women's group that you know. About the same age, kind of doing life, knows you real well. Guys, maybe you're in a guys group or fireside. Parents, these are other family, friends. Kids are about the same age range, kind of doing life together. You respect their parenting philosophies. They respect yours. You're able to give each other feedback. The important part of this is people who are with us, life's problems really aren't all that difficult. They're not all that complicated, but sometimes when it's us and it's personalized, we're so close and in it. We just need someone who's with us who has an outside perspective just to speak some truth in our life, to give us this third-party perspective. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. What is that? It's God using people with us to help us change. Accountability partners are huge. We push accountability big in the student ministry. That's a part of our life groups. That's a part of even our discussion groups on Sunday mornings. We want... Kids holding each other accountable. I have accountability partners in my life. I even have digital accountability partners. Right? My, my online activity is tracked. Anything inappropriate or questionable gets accessed from my phone. Randy and Jeremiah are getting the email instantly. It's iron sharpening iron. You know who I think the biggest influence in our life is when it comes to God using people with us to help us change? I think it's our spouse. I know what you're thinking. You're going, oh, don't say that. You know, if you're sitting next to your spouse, don't be throwing the elbow. I see you. I see the elbows over there. Don't throw elbows. Remember, let's just focus on ourselves for a moment. And who needs to change? It's us, not our spouse. But man, God uses our spouse to help us change. 
I've been married for six years. God has used my wife, Katie, to help me change more than anyone else in my entire life. I mean, it's huge. Now, let me give you an example of what this looks like for me. When I get married six years ago, I hate hospitals, medical stuff, doctors. I'm just not a fan. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I have a problem. I think I do because my wife has exposed this for me. But I hate going to the hospital. Whenever an emergency comes up, my attitude just kind of... Right? I'm not saying, oh, is, are you okay? Is he or she okay? I'm, I'm asking, wait, 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 what's the copay on this? Because I think that urgent care is cheaper than ER. You know, it's, it, it's a broken bone. They can take care of it at urgent care. You know? I mean, and I just, I don't like being there and I just feel uncomfortable. And, you know, you get married. Well, then it's not me just take care of myself. There's another person in the family. And then you have a couple kids. And, I mean, these medical Issues just start increasing, and on a scale of 1 to 10, my graciousness when it comes to medical emergencies is like a negative 14. I mean, it's just off the charts bad. Man, God has used my wife to expose that attitude issue in my life, that lack of grace in my life. And over the years... God's used my wife to help, help me change. And God knew I was speaking on this this week. And so, of course, Monday, six days ago, what happens? My, I get home from work and my wife is feeling terrible. It's to the point she feels like she needs to go see, see a doctor. I said, okay, you know, get home. Let me call, get some people to take care of the kids. I even offered to take her to the ER first. You know, kind of skip the urgent care. You know, hey, ER is going to be quicker. You know, let's go there. And man, we got it handled. Got the kids dropped off. Went went to the the doctors. Got a problem diagnosed. Got some medication. And it was like the most pleasant I've ever been in a medical situation in my entire life. My actions had moved from a negative fourteen up to a ten. Now I'll be honest. My attitude moved from a negative fourteen to maybe like a six. You know, I still had to bite my tongue a little bit and I still cringed a little bit. I'm not as good as I'm going to get, but I'm better than I used to be. God's working in my life, and he's using my wife, my spouse, to help change some of my attitudes. A great action step for this is finding an accountability partner. Maybe getting plugged into to a life group out at Group Links. But... We need to have those people in our life walking next to us, side by side, that God's going to use to help us change. So God uses people to help us change, people who are with us and people who are ahead of us. When I say people who are ahead of us, these are mentors, coaches, counselors, pastors. I mean, you guys get this. I mean, you come here and you listen to Pastor Dan, Pastor Brian, speak some truth in your life. Uh, maybe this is a life group leader. Maybe it's that older guy at the, at the fireside. This is a been there, done that type of person in your life. They have common ground with us, not because they're side by side with us, but because they've, they've already been there and they're looking back on their experience, hopefully with some success, and saying, Aaron, I've been there. Hey, here's what's coming. Ecclesiastes 7.5 says, It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of the fools. Why does, why does Solomon need to write this to us? Because we'd love to hear the, the praise of anyone who will give it to us. But the rebuke of the wise, that stings a little bit, doesn't it? I already talked about it, taking a shot at our pride. It stings a little bit. But we need those people ahead of us who are willing to tell us not what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. I think a prime example of how our pride gets in the way of letting people ahead of us help us change is the reluctance to see a counselor. I mean, you say that C word, that counselor word. If defensive walls start being built up, if you can start giving 101 reasons why you don't need to see a counselor, I'm not the one who needs to see a counselor. You are, right? We start pointing, redirecting the blame. If that's you, guess what? 
you probably need to see a counselor. And, and here's another secret about counselors. You don't have to be in crisis mode to make an appointment. You're allowed to be proactive. Right? Get some advice on relationships, on parenting. They, they'll accept you. you know, they'll, they'll make a slot for you. But we've, we feel defensive against that because it, it takes a shot at our pride. But counselors are a great example of people who are ahead of us, who are willing and ready to be used by God to help us change. Um, I have, a, I have a, a life coach in my life. I meet with him every other week on the phone. Once or twice a year, we get together face-to-face, and this is a guy who's ahead of me. He's a couple decades older than me. He has seven kids. I have two. His oldest is about to graduate college. My oldest is about to graduate kindergarten. He's been married a lot longer than I have, and he's able to sometimes give me that rebuke I need to hear. He's able to look back and say, Aaron, I've been there, done that. Hey, here's a warning sign what's coming down the road that you're on. You might want to get back on the, on the straight path. And it stings a little bit, but man, I sure am glad, and my wife and kids sure are glad that, that he's spending time with me speaking some truth into my life. I think my, one of my favorite stories of how God uses people ahead of us to, to help us change is the story of Daniel Messick. Daniel's one of, our, one of our students in the high school student ministry. He's a junior this year, and he has someone who's ahead of him by a few decades who God uses to help him change. So Daniel, will you tell us your story and how Michael has played a part in helping you change? Hi guys, like, like Aaron said, my name's Daniel. I've been a part of Michael's youth group since about fifth grade, and I'm just here to tell you my story and how being in a youth group has changed me. Um, a little backstory about Michael. He grew up less than privileged. He lived on the streets for part of his life in an orphanage for another part and for another part of his life with a mother who didn't love him. And all these things led him to a life of crime and associating with people he shouldn't have. And Michael, like everyone under the sun, has made a lot of mistakes. But God, being so gracious and resourceful, has used those mistakes as the basis of teaching for small group. Throughout this, whenever I refer to Michael, I really mean his openness and willingness to God to change us through Christ. Like I said, I joined Michael's life group in about fifth grade. Um, I thank him a lot for that because they were designed for middle schoolers, and I'm glad I got in early. Um, one of the big topics about, that we would always talk about was that of respect, getting respect, giving respect. And he said that one of the best ways to get respect from those older than you, the only way to get respect from those older than you, is to respect them. And he taught me to disbelieve the notion that however old you are plays into how mature you are or your level of discernment or wisdom. He taught us about 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise you for your youth, but set an example for the believers in your speech, in your conduct, love, faith, and purity. And that really stuck with me. And another thing he taught us was the best way, one of the better ways to get respect was to respect those in authority, even if you didn't, res- even if you didn't like the person in authority, and how that plays into Romans 13.1, let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no, th- no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And that's another thing that really stuck with me. He also taught me about being a good steward, to tithe my money, something I regularly do now, often giving more than 10%, and just really love others as Christ loves me, and just hear what God has to say to me and about me and about others. But the biggest part Michael's played in my life is he's always been a source of constant Christly conviction. He's always been there to ask the questions I didn't want to be asked and make me think about things I didn't want to think about. Teenagers especially, we focus best on things we shouldn't be focusing on while there's more pressing, less trifling matters God calls us to focus on, and he's always there to redirect my focus. Drugs and alcohol used to be a big part of my life, but Michael, throughout the years, has helped me get away from that and get away from that life of sin I became so accustomed to. And having someone there to really listen and talk has made all the difference. And no one today asked me to plug a life group or say join life groups, but I'm saying join a life group because you will not see change in your life like this unless you join a life group and have someone there to guide you and have others there who are going through the struggle with you. And I thank Michael and the West Side Ministry for all they've done for me. I'm going to give it back to Aaron. Thank you guys a lot for this. Parents, who wants a Michael for your child's life, right? Who wants a Michael for your life? Yeah. Yeah some practical things we can do about it. Find, find, find a Michael for your kid's life. 
You want another adult spiritual mentor who can be reinforcing all the values and lessons that you're teaching at home. Because the reality is your son or daughter may not listen to what you have to say, but they'll listen to what some other adult has to say, even if it's the exact same message. Right? You, more voices, more counsel speaking into the lives of your children, the better. Something else we can practically do about this is be that spiritual mentor for some other child. Maybe you have a, a family friend. Kids are the same age. Man, offer to, to be a spiritual mentor in that person's life. You can always come join student ministry and serve there too. Um, <laughs> God uses people to help us change, people who are with us, people who are ahead of us. The third group, people who created us. Now, it is not my job as a youth pastor to teach teenagers how people are created. It'll come to you. Okay, some of you got it. So if you haven't had this conversation with your children yet, you need to do it before sixth grade, probably before fifth grade. But that's, parents, I'll leave that in your hands. I'll define people who created us, just for the sake of simplicity, as our parents. Now, while we all can learn from our parents, and God still has our parents in our lives to help us change, even me as a 33-year-old, God's using my father to help me change. If you would, could I take a moment and speak directly to the teenagers for, for the next few minutes. Teenagers. God wants to use people to help you change, specifically your parents. Now, I know what you're thinking. Aaron, you don't know my parents. They're old and they're crazy and they don't know how to work an iPhone. And Okay, okay, that may all be true. You may be thinking, Aaron, my parents didn't create me. I'm adopted. Hey, God has you in this family for a very special reason. God wants to use your parents to help you change. You may be thinking, Aaron, my parents didn't create me. I have a stepmother, stepfather. Listen, God has you in this family for a very special reason. He wants to use your parents to help you change. And I get it. I understand. You, you feel the same way I felt when, when I was 14. You feel the same way Mark Twain felt when he was 14. Mark Twain said that when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. All right, we get that. That's real. You feel that way. But listen, your parents, they're doing their best, and they're doing a, a pretty good job, and they can do a better job if you cooperate at raising you to be a successful adult Christ follower. Your parents want you to follow Christ. They want you to love Jesus. They want you to become like Jesus. They want you to share Jesus. And they want you to succeed at life. So when you move out after college or after high school and get a job, they, they want you to succeed so you won't move back in. I mean, they, <laughs> they have your best interests in mind here. Do you know what the book of Proverbs is? The book of Proverbs, and I've been quoting it a lot this morning, it's a book of wisdom written from a father to his sons. Let's read Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. Your parents have wisdom to offer you. You got you to trust me when I say that. I just quoted Mark Twain, but let's, let's go back and finish this quote because I only gave half of it to you. He said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> Who do you think did the learning in that seven years? You think it was dad or you think it was Mark? Yeah. Listen. You'll be amazed at how much your parents know if you'll be willing and open for some change in your life. God uses people to help us change. So let's 
Let's bring it back. What can we all do about this practically? There's a question in your notes. I want everyone to ask this question to someone this next week. What's the one thing I could do differently that would make the biggest change in my life? What's the one thing I could do differently that would make the biggest change in my life? I'm going to help you find the person to ask this question to. Teenagers, I want you to write in the the little blank that's in front of that question. I want you to write in mom and dad. Mom and dad, what's the one thing I could do differently that would make the biggest change in my life? Husbands, I want you to write in your wife's name. Honey, what's the one thing I could do differently that would make the biggest change in my life? Wives in the room, I want you to write your husband's name in. The biggest stud I've ever met. What's the one thing I could do differently that would make the biggest change in my life? I'm telling you, how you ask the question is important too. But I promise you, God will use people in your life to help you change. If you'll be open to the idea, if you lay down your pride, if you realize you have to think, believe, or do something differently, God wants to change us from the inside out. And one of the ways God's, God does that is by using people to help us change. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us so much to come down and meet us exactly where we are at with our flaws and imperfections and with our sin. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you're not willing to leave us there, but you're gonna instill some change in our lives so that we can stand rightly in your presence. So God, will you change us from the inside out through the cross. God, will you use other people to change us? Will you use your holy word to change us? We love you, Jesus. Amen.